uh, ready to go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jigar, and I work at Intersect uh, as an Android engineer. And today I'm going to talk about Kotlin 102. So first question, why 102? Uh, basically, I, last year I gave a Kotlin introduction talk when we all switched to uh, Kotlin in, at Intersect and you know talked about gotchas and what we learned in Kotlin. And this is basically second year, so I learned some more stuff. So this is 102 class. Uh, so let's start with like write code in Kotlin way, right? Uh, so basically, this is all talk about um, idiomatic Kotlin. Uh, for first year of my Kotlin learning, like all I did was basically care about uh, nullability and using those let function and apply function. And then eventually I realized that like most of my code still looks like Java uh, because uh, I'm not really writing the, my code in Kotlin way, like the way Kotlin is supposed to be written, right? Uh, so that's where I started paying more attention to why, how do I basically get better at that? So basically, if you if we start thinking about how, the first thing you can do is like read popular open source Kotlin first code. Like there are good developers, like amazing developers who write Kotlin code, and then you know you can learn a lot from them uh, just by reading their code. Uh, so that's something I would probably suggest you do start doing. Uh, discuss idiomatic way to write Kotlin during PR reviews. So this is something we do at Intersect, and I personally pay attention. I love this idea that we tell each other that, oh, this you can write something like this better in Kotlin, and maybe this is uh, this is how we can improve this in Kotlin way. Maybe you can use this collection class, this, this fancy new method, and stuff like that. So this is all about basically teaching each other, right, uh, and growing together. And third, the third thing is basically ask yourself, is there a better way to write this in Kotlin? If there is, then you basically try to make it better and then push your code. Let's start diving into that. This is one of the apps we have developed at Intersect. It's open source. It's uh, out in public. It's not open source, my bad. Uh, it's called Spackly. It's basically a tool between developer and designer to collaborate. Uh, so you can see that there is a font size uh, here. And you can increase or decrease font size, and it will show up at the at the top. And the like the very minimum requirement is basically that your font size can't be zero, right? So what we do is if you keep saying minus minus eight deep SP, it will get decreased, and then up to ninety nine SP, it will keep increasing. So let's look at like a very simple function for that. Um, for example, we have a max value, which is 99, mean value is eight, and you have a set current value method. So what you do is you first check whether my new value is whether it's greater than max, which is 99 or less than eight. Then what you wanna do is, yeah, it is. Basically that means it's out of your scope. So what you wanna do is if it's newer value is greater than max value, if it's 100, then make it 99, or if it's seven, then make it eight, and then you, set the text, the text input layout, and you value, set the value. Or you do, uh, or, or your uh, value is basically falling into the same range and you are good to go. Now, when you write this, you, you might feel like, oh, this is might be like how you write in Java. So how can we improve this? And then you start digging, doing Stack Overflow and Google and whatever way you can do it. And then you'd have your first intuition, which is basically, yeah, you can improve it. Uh, so we did two things here to improve that function in more of a Kotlin way. One is we use the range, which is like mean value, dot, dot, max value. So rather than writing those greater than, less than, or uh, you made it look like more like more readable code. And the next one is more interesting, which is called you use course in and then provided mean value and max value. And that basically achieves you what you were doing before in a much shorter way. Uh, let's look at the coursing quickly. So coursing is basically uh, does exactly the same thing what we were doing internally. If this is less than minimum value, provide the minimum value. If less than maximum value, provide maximum value. And it also uh, plus point that it accepts the throw because if your mean cannot be greater than maximum, which we definitely missed, so we could have made a mistake. So it's always good to use this, uh, you know, Kotlin functions so that they cover all the cases. Now let's back to let's get back to our code. And now let's add one more time. Can we improve this further? And you again start digging 
and you're saying, why I'm just writing this if and else is every time? Uh, is there something better? And then you found the take if. Uh, so take if is basically a standard function in Kotlin. And what it does is you provide it a value and then it gives you that value if the predicate is true. Otherwise, you basically have a, a nullable and then you can provide a default value. Uh, so let's look at that take if quickly. It just says return this value if satisfied the given predicate or null if doesn't. Uh, so yeah, made it better. And also, if you look, notice, take if is also inline method. So inline is uh, in Kotlin takes this code and puts that into that method. So your method at the end, if the code is compiled, it will look like previously and just take it, which just makes it more readable. Um, so, so yeah, overall, basically, but just trying to reiterate our code and trying to make sure let's do more idiomatic Kotlin. We, we made things more Kotlin way and more readable. Let's, let's take a look at another couple of examples. Very simple function, get is ready. Uh, of course, don't think about logic, it might be weird. But just say if return if valid, then provide our local user ID or else provide no. Very simple function. We we do this all the time. We have like if and else is. And if we again take the example from take if, we can make it better. Like you can just say take a user ID take if is valid. So this is more like more readable that return user ID take if it's valid. Uh, same thing. And since take if is returning you nullable, you don't have to write else null card. Uh, it's free, of course. It's, you just get it for free. Uh, one more example. Uh, we have a preferences value uh, method called get device hash, and then you are getting the device hash. And since it's a hash uh, encrypted, it's a string value. So you say device hash, and then it's a null, right? And then you check null, then you use the Kotlin slat, and then you have a hash, which is you define, and then you decrypt it. Decryption gives you a nullable, and then finally you do to int. And if you want to improve this, let's try that. Now we can use take unless, which is exactly opposite to what take with was doing. So here, take unless it gives us that value if the predication is not true. So what we want to do here is again we are using with. So with this get string, uh, if this take unless this equals null, uh, otherwise, uh, and then to it. So again, just writing smaller chunks of Kotlin-ish code, uh, we can improve things and you know make less mistakes. Let's take another uh, section, which is like some interesting finds I did just by you know going through learning Kotlin and again going through this practice of how do we make this better and more Kotlin-ish way, right? Uh, so mutability in list. Um, this is something very interesting I found, and I was actually shocked to find this. Maybe it's uh, uh, it's that's how basically it works. Uh, so we have a mutable list of gift cards, which is called one, two, three, four, five, six, two elements. And you have a method called set gift cards and you send it uh, gift cards to list because this accepts the list, which is the more abstract uh, 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 class of the, of the list. And now if you print it, you will see output one, two, three, and four, five, six, right? Pretty easy, pretty obvious. And now Kotlin list has an advantage because Kotlin list has only read only. So if you try to do list.add, and say seven, eight, nine, then it won't work. The ad will give you an error uh, because uh, it's read-only method. So Kotlin's list abstract class doesn't have add method at all. Compared to Java, which it had. So in Java, you could do something like cards.add and 789. So you know it's definitely improvement in that sense that list is read-only and you couldn't add something. What blew my mind is this. You can actually cast that list back into mutable list, and then you can add it. And if you do that, you will get the output of all three. Uh, so even though you got a list, that list is not technically immutable list. It's just it's just wrapped into a list, but under the hood, it's mutable list. So this is like super error prone. If you if you think of like creating an API, especially dealing with like you know payments or like database entries, and you are thinking like and especially like threading, and if you have list, uh, you you always think, oh, I have list, so I can just do anything. But under the hood, things can change, and you can yourself basically modify the reference by mistake uh, by doing anything like this. Let's take another example of this, uh, which is again like a contradiction contradiction to how Kotlin works. 
so we have a new gift card and instead of mutable list before we are now creating a list of uh, uh, basically creating the abstract list out of that and now if you do set gifts new gift cards and if you do the same thing now it says unsupported operation exception so now you are confused because on, on your set gift card you only have list but you actually can't rely on whether to depend on that list or not because if the if the caller gave you a mutable list then you you might be able to cast it to mutable and add something and your caller is basically how your caller has defined the list if you do the same thing then now you get an unsupported operation so it's pretty tricky uh, in java if you know that java has basically something called unmodifiable collection so collection is not on unmodified list even guava has something even kotlin has something to solve this problem Kotlin has a library uh, called Kotlin X Collection Immutables. And this is something you can add on top of just like a normal library. And that will basically give you the mutability. Uh, so just implementation, just add Kotlin X Collection Immutable right now, it's at 0.3.2 version. And with that, what you can do is you can say list the two immutable list. And once you do that, and now you try to add list as mutable list and say the same thing basically. And if, if you notice the above, it's still sending you the mutable list. It's gonna give you a class class exception because now this immutable list is completely different variation uh, of list. You cannot just cast it into mutable. So this gives you that uh, flexibility uh, that you, if you want to achieve the proper immunity, immutability in the list collection. Let's take another example, which is something I found super weird not weird, just uh, I, I, it was interesting to find out that I could do this. Uh, execute Lambda in Q. Let's let's take an example. You have a requirement that I want to create an analytics. Uh, uh, is You have an analytics API, right? And you have analytics for product listing in the app. And then once user clicks on one of the products, you want to uh, send the analytics as well. But you want to make sure that your product listing analytics call happens on, like before the product listing action call so that you have a sequential APIs. Now, uh, as an example, we have a playground SDK and you have a method called send product list analytics and you have another method called send product list action analytics. And both of them are basically calling, creating a global uh, scope, which is core routine, just simple stuff. Uh, and then uh, create, calling the suspended functions of both the put calls and then retrofit takes care. Now, for example, if a caller is calling send product list analytics and send product list action analytics, they just keep calling it. And you have no way to basically know that they will call, they will be sequential, right? Because this is your SDK, that's an app, and you can't control that. So there, there are multiple ways to solve this. One is you create an executor service and you make sure that only one calls happen at a time, or, or you create some kind of you know, crazy code where you make sure that there is this sequential, uh, uh, you know, lock or some synchronize, uh, like more complex stuff. Even you can use Rx Java and make it an observable stream, which is only like one at a time. So what I was trying to do is solve it in a, in a, in a simpler way. And what I could do, I found out is I can have a queue of suspended functions. So think of it, this is a array list of functions which you will be calling. It's not just error list of items. So since we have the lambdas, we can do things like this. So what I did as a simple uh, example, I created a suspension function and call nq put. And what it takes is a suspended function as an argument. So if I have a empty uh, a queue, which is there is no put call going on, then I'll just uh, make the put, add the put, add the suspended function in the queue, invoke it, and that's right. And since it's a suspended function, it's a sequential, it's a sync call. That's why f dot invoke will always happen before the put call and put call q dot apply starts. Right. So that's that makes it sequential. So now by the time this function is going on, if there is another put call happen, then that will go into the add part in the else part, and then it will just keep doing. And that way you have a super easy way to uh, basically get a sequence of calls happening. Of course, this is just a sample example, but you can you have to make sure that you know things are going in the right way. But I, I quickly tested this and it worked, and it just surprised me that I could have a list of lambdas and, and lambda functions and call them. And then now your send product and uh, list analytics will basically look like uh, 
you have a, a scope function and you say NQ put and it's a lambda, so you put that NQ. So now if you call these functions 20 times, it will make sure that they, the whole function block will be called uh, sequentially. Even, even if you have like, if you function and then if you perform some operations on the response, they will all get performed one by one. Uh, third, third interesting uh, uh, topic is tricking something with type aliases. So we we know, I hope you know that there is type aliases is a concept in Kotlin where you can have a lambda function or anything, any basically anything which you can type alias with. So you can give it a, like a nickname, which basically behaves like the same type. Um, as an example, we have a class uh, called Playground Manager, and it has a manage function. And if you're an app, your app is calling it like playground manager dot manage. Now, if you notice, there is a typo, which is that I have a spelling mistake, M-A-N-E-G-E-R. And uh, uh, think of this as like, you have already shipped your library or you have to ship your app and your app is using this manager in like 50 classes. Uh, yeah, you could easily, you know, just rename your manager and just replace E with A. But think of the consequences. You have like refactoring to do, or even if you do like auto refactoring, you're touching 50 files. And if you're a library, you are basically breaking your app code because you change or uh, you rename your class, right? And But you want to rename it. So how do you trick something? So you can trick something like this with a type alias. Uh, so you, you basically have your class playground manager. And what you did is you define a type alias that your previously typo, which is M-E-N-E-G-R, is equal to Playground Manager, which is the new class. And if you do this, now your Kotlin code below, it will still work on the app side with M-E-N-E-G-R, uh, but on SDK side, you fix the problem. And of course, eventually you want to make it deprecated and you know, go through the deprecation cycle. Uh, but this is this is something you can you know make it very simply and, and fix at multiple like fix at one places and reflecting everywhere. Uh, as you would expect. Uh, let's take a look at one more example like that, executive when. This is something I found um, and I had no idea while I was working. I, I basically found a bug and and I, I had to search about this and that's how I came to know. Uh, it is five years old problem and um, it's still pending at, in, in the jet brains and they're still uh, debating about this. So let, let's let's dive into this. So when we all learn in Kotlin that, oh, this when is a fancy block where, you know, it will make sure you never make a mistake and all your, all the uh, expression you're passing, it will make sure you have all the cases, otherwise you have to put this else uh, else case, right? So if you if you look at this, there is a sim class called view state and there is a data class, which is a part of the, it's, it's a child of that sim class called normal state. And there is a another state called loading state. And you have a function like this called handle state. And then you're passing the state, you have a van expression. And then this, if you notice, this is not used as an expression. It's because there is no written value. So in the van, in the normal case, you are doing something. You're probably calling your view code or in the load, you're just calling view dot show something, uh, show loading spinner. So uh, life is good, all good. And then next day you realize, oh, you forgot an error case because you want to show error. And, and then you try to run the app and you notice there are no errors. Uh, that's weird because I thought like I added the when and then I added the error. So it should tell me that, you know, error is missing and put an else case or something. But the problem is because it's not used an expression, there is no return value when never does that. And if, if you try to basically solve, if you try to mimic this as an expression. So for example, if you in the when you return something and set it in a value, now your when is used as an expression and not without expression. So now as soon as you do this, your when will give an error saying, oh, when expression must be exhaustive and add necessary error branch or else branch exists, uh, else branch instead. So now it forces you. So this is, this is a common problem and very easy to make this mistake and there is a popular solution everywhere now. Uh, this is an example from the Blade app, uh, popular open source app. If you haven't checked out, take a look. It has really good Kotlin code, lots of learning there. 
Uh, and Kotlin has a utility class. And what they have done is they have an extension function called exhaustive. And it just takes, it just basically invokes the same uh, object and returns the same objects. It basically does nothing except just returning, but making something as an expression. So what people do nowadays, they, they whenever they write when statement without an expression, they, at the end, they do dot exhaustive. And what this does is it converts the when statement, which is not as an expression, converts in an expression. And when you do that, when will throw you an error saying you have to uh, uh, add the error state, which of course I missed in this slide, um, but I, hopefully you remember from the previous one. Uh, so this is uh, something people have been requesting. People are requesting to JetBrains that at least sealed class should have some parameters when it's used with when, maybe when should know this, uh, lots of debates going on, but definitely something error prone. And people, every like popular open source project, they have this extension function now. So maybe you want to add that into your app or library code too. So you can use this and you know uh, make sure that you don't make a mistake. Um, that's probably it. I probably finished early and I hope you learned something. Thank you. I was muted. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great talk, man. Um, I'm gonna. I feel like we should give people, you know, about a minute to to vote for questions. I feel like we didn't formally do that last time. So if you have a question, because uh, maybe you don't like read the chat during the talk, which totally makes sense. Why wouldn't you? I added my slides as well in the chat. The only problem with that is since my my presentation is in Keynote, you might feel weird uh, like when you're looking at the slides because like all the errors are in a in different PDF slides. But anyways, it's there. So yeah, and I'll look at the question. So is to immutable list preferred to wrapping a list with collection? So you, uh, uh, just before you get started. Uh, sorry, sorry. My finger slipped, and the top voted question yeah. by Anton got checked out <laughs> before you even got to read it. So, uh, Anton, if you can just post it again, it was definitely the top voted by like a solid yeah, like ten votes. <laughs> I saw it go away, and I went, "Oh, did it end to leave?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you just reshare the question or just retype? I guess he'll. It might take him a minute to write it, so we'll just tap it at the end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Feel free to, to to get to field the first one. Okay, cool. So, is to immutable list preferred to wrapping a list with collections dot immodifiable list? Uh, so that's collection or immodifiable is a Java function. Uh, so if you do that, the only disadvantage of that is it throws an exception when you try to modify it. Kotlin actually avoids that. Kotlin makes it that, yeah, of course you are trying to cast it, then I, in my example, it was string cast as expression, but in Kotlin, you just cannot do add because add method is not available. So I would still prefer to immutable and add that library as your dependency. It's, it's a very small lightweight library. If you're doing lots of immutables, immutables, like immutables by like programming, you should probably use that. What Kotlin feature have you encountered that actually made your code less readable? Uh, this is funny because I, I also pay really good attention to this. And the biggest one I found is uh, like abuse of Kotlin, especially if you have like, you know, five different nullables, you keep doing let, 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 let. If you keep doing also, 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 uh, it just makes Kotlin really bad. And one thing I also, one thing that also makes it um, tricky is when you do like lots of uh, complex, uh, like those lambdas and lambdas keep doing it. Uh, some of the tools, which are like code, code static analysis tools, they will flag your code. They will say your code is too complex. Uh, so for example, detect, detect is a, a Kotlin int analysis. Uh, detect will tell you that your, you know, your complex code complexity is very high. So I would avoid that. What I would do is basically I would return immediately. So if I have two null uh, checks, I would basically do, uh, you know, that uh, value and then, you know, Lambda, the, uh, Elvis operator and I'll just return the method. In that way, Kotlin also do smart casting. So at the whole, whole, whole act, like your uh, rest of the method will basically not worry about that. I believe it was where you draw the line between Kotlin and, and Tom, uh, Do you have any guidelines for that? As well. I think he wrote, he wrote uh, himself. 
it, uh, three, third one down, Sorry? Anton rewrote it for himself. Oh, do you have guidelines how to decide between too much Kotlinist here? Kotlin tierness and readability, or do your team involve that guideline over time? Uh, so I recently started doing this, uh, that I pay attention to things like sonar cube, uh, even code climate, uh, basically anything which uses detect of Kotlin. And I try to understand what is that, uh, what is that, uh, the, the rough line and what came out to be recently is like as long as i'm breaking down methods to like somewhat smaller methods not like you know it's crazy small like 60 70 lines of methods which made more sense i think eventually just code becomes automatically more readable so it's, it's all about if you have like too many uh you know lat or any basically too many of you know like indents going on in your code i think that's not good so if you have like a couple of indents, I think that's fine. So, and that's also make things easier to understand. Uh, so I just, I just go with that rule and it works out for me. Uh, I, ho I hope that answers your question. I think the number 10 most voted is also the same thing about readability. Uh, I have found that people kind of abuse some concepts and that's how the code gets more unreadable. But otherwise, if you just keep doing breakdown methods, Eventually, everything you know ties together. Breaking down methods helps you in unit testing, and then thinking you like you know how how all methods make more unit testable, and then also make score your readable, and also you do more Kotlin stuff. So it's like a one win, like one good practice makes you like tons of good advantages. So yeah, that's all. Isn't calling suspended function in coroutine launch keep them sequential? If I'm correct. Concurrency is achieved explicitly by using async. Do we need to do priority queue then? Uh, so this is where, where like someone else is calling your code. Uh, this is it's not like up to your hand. For example, if I'm on the app side, if I have a library, if I'm calling your library's function in one uh, screen, and if I go to another screen too fast and I made another call, you don't have common place for that, right? This is more like you from different places you have a code which is getting executed out of your control make them sequential. Uh, what you are saying with async, if it's, it makes sense when you have, you know that you have three functions sequentially called by yourself, then you will do them sequentially. But this is out of your control that who is calling your code and your method. So that's where this priority queue or anything like this comes in a picture where you have to maintain or think of it like if you have a 2FA uh, uh, you know, function or something calling in your API, it is calling you, giving you a 2FA, uh, check to do in your app. What you will do, like you have to first make a 2FA call, do some functionality, and then continue with your uh, previous call. So you, in this, those kind of thing, you can basically make those lambdas and put them in a queue um, and achieve the same thing. Uh, it was an easy example, but I think like putting lambda in a list was crazy to me and it worked out. So that was something I wanted to point out, but uh, more we can explore more later. Uh, so yeah, I think that's about it. Do, do I have more time, or I can go? I can go all day. It's up to you. Um, yeah, if you want to feel that final one about exhaustive, go for it, man. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll exhaustive of yeah, exhaustive on when even without the exhaustive, the industry IDE will give at least a warning. It doesn't give you warning, especially when you have not an expression. Like all my code, like whatever I posted in the slideshow, they're all like live from like IDE copy pasted and they never, IDE doesn't give you warning at least at this point, maybe Android Studio or maybe 4.2 Kennedy has it. Uh, as of now, 4.0 stable doesn't have that. So maybe it's something coming up and Android fix it with just a lint warning. Uh, that would be great actually, if that happens. Uh, what were the names of good examples of Kotlin code to read? I would say Play app is pretty good. Uh, then uh, I'm I'm actually reading Android X code, Android KTX code. If they are like uh, the paging three library was completely written in Kotlin, so you can take a look at that. Uh, go to cs.androidsearch.com. That's like the best thing ever, and I keep reading that. I'm sharing that in the chat. That's an amazing tool. You can read basically read. Uh, if you don't know about that, you can just keep reading Android code all day, and it's really helpful. So I keep doing that and find out some gems from Android Steam as well, and uh, and that, yes, just to, and also one of the uh, base codes I found also in OKHTP4, OKHTP4 converted into 100% Kotlin, 
uh, in the 4.x version. And they done some amazing like you know stuff internally. So check out our case before as well.